In this week's block of scripture, we will consider incidences and teachings in the book of Acts, chapters 22 through 28, which will finish up the book of Acts. We will start with Acts 21, 39 through chapter 22, verse 23, where Paul preached to the Jews who opposed him. Realizing that Paul was not a rebel, the Roman captain followed Paul to address the crowd who had assailed him. The crowd at the temple listened to Paul to tell his conversion story until he mentioned being sent to the Gentiles. At that point, they reacted with animosity, casting off their outer cloaks and throwing dust into the air, acts by which Jews commonly expressed abhorrence and indignation. I think one of our tests in this life is whether we will let anybody who's repentant join this church, or do we become exclusive and traditional? Again, we see the faithfulness of Nephi's words that the guilty take the truth to be hard, for it cutteth them to the very center. And now, my brethren, if ye are righteous and were willing to hearken to the truth and give heed to it, that you might walk uprightly before God, then you would not murmur because of the truth and say, Thou speakest hard thieves against us. Probably one of the most memorable and recent is when the blacks were now able to receive the priesthood and how many, or I don't know if many, but some in the church murmured against that and some even left and could not pass that test of letting all have gospel blessings. Acts 22, 24 through 30. Paul invoked his right as a Roman citizen. The Roman chief captain could not under understand Paul's speech, which was delivered in Aramaic, nor could he discover why the crowd was so angry at Paul. Therefore, the captain ordered that Paul be scourged or whipped and questioned. A scourge, which was a whip or a lash made of long strips of leather that were studded with bits of metal or bone and fastened in a wooden handle, was a weapon of torture that could, max, which could maim and even kill. In response to the order, Paul protested that he was a Roman citizen and therefore was protected from ex examination by torture. Roman citizenship carried with it important privileges and was not easily obtained, as made clear by the conversation recorded in Acts 22, 24 through 30. Acts 22, verse 30 through chapter 23, verse 10, where Paul appears before a Jewish council. When Paul was brought before the Jewish council, the high priest ordered that Paul be struck in the face. This violated Jewish law, which protected accused persons from being punished until found guilty. Paul's angry response was not purposefully disrespectful to the high priest. He simply failed to recognize the high priest, perhaps because he had been away from Jerusalem for so long. When he realized that he had reviled the high priest, Paul immediately expressed, expressed deference to the offense, if not the man. Realizing that the council was composed of two fractions, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Paul cleverly turned the members of the council against one another by declaring that he was a Pharisee and believed in the resurrection. The Pharisees on the council then defended Paul against the Sadducees, who did not believe in the resurrection. Acts 23, 6, and then chapter 24, 15, and 21, verse 21, and then Acts 26, 8, 23, or shows us one of the central focuses of Paul's testimony. Acts 23, 6. But when Paul perceived 
that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee and the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called into question. Chapter 24, 14 says, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets, and have hope towards God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And then verse 21, Except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. And then 26.8, Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should rise, raise the dead? Verse 22, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say which should come. Verse 23, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should shew light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And so the resurrection of the dead in its reality was a central focus of Paul's testimony and to the people that he was preaching. Thus, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. This is Jacob speaking in 2 Nephi 9, 8-10. Back to the quote. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Nephi provides one of the best descriptions of what would become of us if there was no resurrection. Oh, the wisdom of God, his mercy, his grace. For behold, if the flesh should rise no more, our spirits must become subject to that angel who fell from before the presence of the eternal God and became the devil to rise no more. And our spirits must have become like unto him, and we become devils, angels to a devil, to be shut out from the presence of our God, and to remain with the father of lies in misery like unto himself, yea, to that being who from the presence of our God and to remain with the father of lies is misery like unto himself. I'm sorry, I, I repeated that sentence. Yea, to that being who beguiled our first parents, who transformed himself nigh unto an angel of light, and stirreth up the children of men unto secret combinations of murder, and all manner of secret works of darkness. How great the goodness of our God, who prepareth a way for our escape from the grasp of this awful monster. Yea, that monster, death and hell, which I call the death of the body, and also the death of the spirit. Uh, 2 Nephi 9, 8 through 10. What a blessing the resurrection is. That is the escape, brothers and sisters. The escape in mortality of anything is Jesus Christ. It's in Corinthians, remember, Paul says that you will not be tempted more than you're able to bear. If you take the escape, the escape is Christ. That's in 1 Corinthians. I forget the chapter. But if we do not take the escape, we will be tempted more than we could ever bear. We must take the escape in Jesus Christ. Acts 23.3, Whited Wall. The whited wall epithet refers to the custom of whitewashing a wall to hide dirt and stains. Compare Jesus' reference to whited sepulchers, Matthew 23, 27. Both images depict hypocrisy, and indeed Paul considered any Jewish leader a hypocrite who would order someone to be physically abused contrary to Mosaic law. 
Acts 23.10-11, through 11, Paul was visited by the Savior. Fearing that Paul would be pulled in pieces by the angry multitude, the chief captain took Paul into protective custody. While Paul was being detained by the Roman soldiers, the resurrected Savior visited him and assured him that he would live to bear his testimony in Rome. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles discussed this visit. He said, In his persecuted and straitened state, Paul needed comfort and assurance from on high. How shall such be given him? The Lord could have sent an angel. He could have spoken by the power of the Holy Spirit to the Spirit within Paul. Or he could have opened the heavens and let him see again the wonders of eternity. But this time... Thanks to his valiant service, his unwavering devotion, his willingness to suffer even unto death in the cause of Christ, this time Paul was blessed with the personal ministrations of the Lord of Heaven himself. Jesus stood by his side. Without question, much was said and much transpired, of which there has been preserved to us only the promise that the Lord's special apostle would yet bear witness to the master in Rome. So it is left up to the Savior on how he comforts us. It's in this case he felt it was appropriate that Christ himself should go. But that does not make being visited by the Holy Ghost or comforted by the Holy Ghost or receiving visions any less more powerful. Acts 22, 12-15, a conspiracy to kill Paul. A group of Jews bound themselves under a curse saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. That's Acts 23, 12. This conspiracy was similar to the secret combinations described in the Book of Mormon. Secret combinations work under a cloak of secrecy and are characterized by forming oath-making, threatens of violence, including murder, and plunder, and the seeking of gain and power. You can see that in Alma 37, 25-31, Helaman 6, 16-31, or Ether 8, 13-26. It's not a far stretch to make the statement that we see these secret combinations in work today, those who seek gain and power through plunder and murder and violence. Acts 23, 16 20, through chapter 24, 20, verse 21, Paul on trial before Felix. Paul's nephew heard of the secret plot to kill Paul and quickly told Paul who sent him to inform the Roman officers. The chief captain, knowing that Paul is a Roman citizen, made arrangements to have Paul escorted by a contingent of soldiers to Caesarea to appear at a trial before the Roman governor Felix. Several Jewish priests from Jerusalem attended Paul's trial in Caesarea, and they hired Tertullius, a Roman lawyer and orator, to convince Felix of Paul's alleged wrongdoings. The charges levied against Paul were that he was a pestilent fellow, meaning he was an annoyance who endangered society, that he was the leader of a seditious group, and that he had profaned the temple. A similar charge of sedition had been brought against the Savior in Luke 23, 2-5, and John 18:30. After listening respectfully to Saturn, Tertullius's orator, Paul skillfully deflected the charges against him, stating that even though 12 days had passed since he was accused, no credible witness had been found to testify against him. He also affirmed his loyalty to God and mentioned that he had come to Jerusalem to deliver alms that uh, means the money they had collected, showing that his purpose was to relieve suffering and not to incite rebellion. This is partial fulfillment of the Savior's words, 
Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for greater is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted the prophets which were before you. Thus giving Paul and the other apostles the opportunity to practice the Savior's injunction, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Brothers and sisters, how could we ever practice this characteristic, characteristic and attribute of Christ unless we are sometimes confronted with those that revile and persecute us? And then we have to decide on what our reaction will be. Acts 24, 14 through 15, the way. In Acts, the term the way is often used to refer to Christianity. It denotes the path or course of Christians. Central to Christian belief is the doctrine that Jesus Christ is the way of salvation, John 14, 6, and that through him all will be resurrected. Paul declared that the real reason the Jews opposed him was his belief in the resurrection. See Acts 24, 14 through 15. However, he asserted that his message of the resurrection was not heresy, but was identical to the long-held hope of the Jewish nation. President Thomas S. Monson spoke of the universal hope of the resurrection of Christ can bring to all of us, saying, through tears and trials, through fears and sorrows, through the heartache and loneliness of losing loved ones, there is assurance, assurance that life is everlasting. Our Lord and Savior is the living witness that such is so. With all my heart and the fervency of the Father of my soul, I lift up my voice and testimony as a special witness and declare that God lives. Jesus is his Son, the only begotten of the Father in the flesh. He is our Redeemer. He is our Mediator with the Father. He, he it was who died on the cross to atone for our sins. He became the first fruits of the resurrection. Because he died, all shall live again. That doctrine will only bring us comfort, brothers and sisters, if that doctrine is in our heart. We may understand it intellectually, but if it's not burned into our heart, then it cannot bring the comfort that President Monson is promising here. But if it enters into our heart and becomes a part of our soul and our life, then there is hope in the resurrection. Acts 24, 16, a conscience void of offense. President Russell M. Nelson spoke about what it means to have a conscience void of offense toward God and man. One day each of us will give an account to the Lord. This awareness was evident in a serious conversation I had years ago with a dear friend facing the end of his mortal life. I asked him if he was ready to die. I'll never forget his answer. With courage and conviction, he said, my life is ready for inspection. Can you imagine being able to say that with a clear conscience? When the prophet Joseph Smith faced death, he said, I am going like a lamb to the slaughter, but I am as calm as a summer's morning. I have a conscience void of offense toward God and towards all men. Doctrine and Covenants 135.4 Now is the time to prepare for your own ultimate interview. You might ask yourself, Do I pay tithing with a willing heart? Do I obey the word of wisdom? Is my language free from obscenities and swearing? Am I morally righteous? Am I truly grateful for the atonement that makes my resurrection a reality and eternal life possible? 
Do I honor temple covenants that seal loved ones to me forever? Good questions to ponder and to consider. Probably each week as we partake of the sacrament. Acts 24, verses 24 through 26. When I have a convenient season. Felix's time as Roman governor was marked by cruelty and licentiousness. Felix kept Paul in prison for two years, hoping to extort money from him. Despite his corrupt nature, Felix was deeply moved by Paul's testimony of Jesus Christ, but delayed hearing him further, saying that he would call for Peter later when he had a convenient season. L. Russell, M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostle Council members to make decisions based on more than mere convenience. He said, sometimes we are tempted to let our lives be governed more by convenience than by covenant. It is not always convenient to live gospel standards and stand up for truth and testify of the restoration. It usually is not convenient to share the gospel with others. It isn't always convenient to respond to a call in the church, especially one that stretches our abilities. Opportunities to serve others in meaningful ways, as we have covenanted to do, rarely come at a convenient time. But there is no spiritual power in living by convenience. The power comes as we keep our covenants. I've always thought a good title for a book would be The Inconvenient Messiah. Following Christ, being faithful and loyal to him in all things and in all places will never be convenient. Acts 24, verse 27, and then chapter 25, verse 9, willing to shew the Jews a pleasure. Rather than release Paul, Felix courted the favor of the Jews by leaving Paul in prison for two years. Felix's successor, Porcius Festus, acted with similar political interest when he proposed to send Paul to Jerusalem, where Paul's enemies hoped to kill him. Elder James E. Faust, the first president, spoke against acting slowly to gain the approval of others. He said, men and women who attempt to gain notice and approval of the group from whom they seek acceptance, such peer pressure may cause them to do things they would not otherwise do. This is acting out of weakness, not strength. Joseph Smith learned about fearing God more than fearing man after losing the 116 pages. Behold, this is quoting Doctrine and Covenants 3, 5 through 8. Behold, you, meaning Joseph, have been entrusted with these things. But how strict were your commandments? And remember also the promises which were made to you, if you did not transgress them. For behold, how oft you have transgressed the commandments and laws of God and have gone on in the persuasions of man. For behold, you should not have feared man more than God. Although men set at naught the counsels of God and despise his words, yet you should have been faithful and he would have extended his arm and supported you against all the fiery darts of the adversary, and he would have been with you in every time of trouble. This is early in the calling of Joseph Smith as a prophet, seer, and revelator, and in his translation process. And he is being taught not to be persuaded and influenced by man. After this event, Joseph never ever makes this mistake again. He is true and faithful even unto death to fear God more than man. What a tribute to his character. Acts 25.11 Why Paul appeared unto Caesar. 
Paul realized that his life would be in danger if he returned to Jerusalem to be tried, as Festus suggested he do. Therefore, Paul chose to appeal to Caesar instead. As a Roman citizen, Paul had the right to appeal to have his case tried directly before Caesar in Rome. Acts 25, 13-22, Herod Agrippa II. Herod Agrippa II, also called Marcus Julius Agrippa, was the seventh and last king of the Jewish Herodian dynasty. He ruled the territories northeast of the Sea of Galilee from about A.D. 55 to 93. He was the son of Herod Agrippa I, who ordered the death of James and imprisoned Peter, the grandson of Herod Antipas, who had John the Baptist beheaded, and the great-grandson of Herod the Great, who ordered the slaughter of the infants of Bethlehem. Agrippa's kingdom lay to the north of Festus's territory. Agrippa and his sister Bernice, who some believes he was having an incestuous affair with, visited Festus in Caesarea while Paul was in prison there. Because Agrippa was a Jew and was therefore more familiar with Jewish affairs than Festus, who was a Roman, Festus hoped that Agrippa could help him understand the accusation against Paul and also help draft his letter to Caesar. Acts 25, 23 through chapter 26, 29, Paul's defense before Agrippa. When Paul spoke before Agrippa, he recounted how he had persecuted Christians as a Pharisee, how he had seen a vision on the road to Damascus, and how he had therefore preached the gospel. In this defense before Agrippa, Paul took a different approach than he had taken when he spoke before the Roman governor Felix. To the governor, Paul had emphasized that he was innocent of sedition the charge that would have been of most concern to a Roman ruler. To Agrippa, who was Jewish, Paul emphasized his faithfulness as a Jew, discerning that Agrippa believed the writings of the Jewish prophets. Paul explained that his teachings to Jews and Gentiles were in the traditions of the prophets. Acts 26.19 Not disobedient unto heavenly vision. Paul declared to Agrippa that he had been true to the heavenly vision he received. Like Paul, we should obey the directions we receive from the Lord, whether they come in the form of promptings from the Holy Ghost, the word of scriptures, or the voice of the living prophets. Sometimes we are intimidated or feel... Um, that will be made fun of if we stand up from the truth and those things of the Spirit which many do not believe in. Paul was true and faithful to his spiritual experiences. President Ezra Taft Benson taught, The greatest test of this life is obedience to God. We will prove them herewith, saith the Lord to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. Abraham 3.25 The great task of life is to learn the will of the Lord and then to do it. And that's not always easy because submitting to his will may require hard things out of us and will not be popular with the world. Acts 26, verses 22 through 26, Paul testifies of Christ and declares this thing was not done in a corner. Paul testified of the gospel and of the Savior's death and resurrection to both Festus and King Agrippa, who was a Jew. After Festus objected to his teachings, Paul declared to King Agrippa that the king knew what he was teaching for this thing was not done in a corner. The truth of the gospel is not hidden or done in a corner, but rather it is a light shining on a hill. 
This was true in the Savior's day and in Paul's day, and it's true in our day as well. We do not try to do things secretly or go behind closed doors in this gospel, but openly declare Jesus is the Christ and that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is his only true and living church upon the face of the earth. Acts 26, 22-31 Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Acts 26, 22-29 provides us with a glimpse into Paul's style, the teaching style. He taught what all prophets, including Moses, have taught that Jesus Christ should suffer, die, and raise from the dead. Paul recognized that King Agrippa knew the truth of these teachings, and Paul wished that the king would make a total commitment to the truth. Instead, Agrippa replied, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian, shows that Agrippa chose not to act on his knowledge that Paul had taught the truth. Can you imagine? That's probably one of the most saddest sentences in all of humanity. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. What good is almost thou persuadest me? Oh, I almost made it to the celestial kingdom. Oh, I almost kept the law of chastity. How? What is the word stupid? of a statement this is. President Harold B. Lee applied the words of King Agrippa to members of the church who attempt to excuse themselves from obedience. A good bishop made an interesting comment about what he called the saddest words that he knows of a man in high station. He then read from the word in the days of the Apostle Paul when Paul before King Agrippa had borne his powerful testimony of his conversion. King Agrippa's reply was almost, thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Then the bishop said, the king knew the truth, but he lacked the courage to do which would be required. And then the bishop characterized some things that he discovered in his own ward in a short but powerful sermon. In ex in, in, in response to the master, I'm sorry, I misspelled that. In response to the master, come follow me, some members almost, he said, but not quite say, thou persuadest me almost to be honest, but I need extra help to pass a test. Almost thou persuadest me to keep the Sabbath day holy, but it's fun to play ball on Sunday. Almost thou persuadest me to love my neighbor, but he is a rascal to be tolerant. Are we true and faithful, or are we going to be guilty and try to get out of things by saying, well, I almost did it? Acts 26, verse 26, 22 through 26, um, President Lee's quote is continued. Of uh, be tolerant of others' views, but they are dead wrong. To go home teaching, but it's so cold and damp outside tonight. To pay tithes and offerings, but we do need a new color TV. Almost, almost, almost. Ella Bruce C. Hafen of the 70 emphasized, if we must give all that we have, then our giving only almost everything is not enough. If we almost keep the commandments, we, most re, we almost receive the blessings. Can you see how absurd this word almost is? Elder Neil A. Maxwell noted that Agrippa's remark was not a flippant one. He was seriously touched. The Revised Standard Version of the Bible renders the passage of Acts 26 verses 28 through 29, as follows. In a short time, you think to make me a Christian. And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day 
might become such as I am, except for these times. Acts 27 verse 9, the fast was not already passed. Agrippa, Bernice, and Festus confessed together that this, and decided that Paul was not guilty of any crime. However, they could not release him because he had not yet been tried by Caesar. Agrippa told Festus this man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed to Caesar. Paul and his companions were sent to Rome by ship, escorted by a Roman centurion. However, sailing was dangerous because the fast was, not, was now already passed. The past probably referred to the Jewish holy day called the Day of Atonement, which marked the beginning of the season during which it was generally regarded as unsafe to travel on the Mediterranean Sea because of violent storms. The Day of Atonement usually took place in late September or early October. Acts 27.10, verse 21 through 22, and verse 31. Paul exercised the gift of seership. Paul foresaw the danger that was to befall the ship that was to carry him to Rome. He perceived that the voyage would end with a hurt and much damage, that there would be no loss of any man's life, and that the passengers would be preserved only if they stayed on board the ship. These verses provide an example of Paul acting as a seer. And may I just say, a seer is only as good as the heed we give unto them. Elder John A. Woodso of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles declared, A seer is one who sees with spiritual eyes. He perceives the meaning of that which seems obscured to others. Therefore, he is an interpreter and clarifier of eternal truth. He foresees the future from the past and present. This he does by the power of the Lord. In short, he is one who sees, who walks in the Lord's light with open eyes. Please do not mistake that Elder Woodso just said that the president of the church, whoever it is, being President Nelson today, is perfect. That is not what he says. He says he has the gift of seership to see things and to help us as is needed. But he is not infallible in his life. Acts 27, 11 through 12. Three reasons why some reject apostolic counsel. One, Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. We put our trust in the arm of flesh. Those who have worldly experience and training, people today sometimes reject the words of seers or other church leaders because their counsel does not coincide with the opinion of so-called experts in the world. So that's one reason why we reject apostolic counsel. Because we don't think that they can speak on things that they're not expert in. The Holy Ghost and the Father and the Son are expert in all things. And it can inspire his leaders then to be expert in all things when necessary. Number two, and because the haven was not commodious in winter, it's not convenient. The haven was not commodious to winter in, meaning it was not a convenient location to spend the winter months. We reject apostolic counsel because a lot of times it is not convenient. And I do not want to submit my will to the Father. I want to do what I want to do. Number three, the more part the advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenice and there to winter. Paul's counsel was not what the majority wanted. For many individuals, it makes more sense to agree with the majority than to agree with the servant of God, whose words are not meant to be popular. Wasn't it Elder Hinckley who said, have the courage to stand alone? 
and sometimes we will have to demonstrate to stand alone in the doctrines of Christ instead of following the majority of the world. Acts 27, 21. There will always be consequences in not following apostolic counsel. Elder Nile Maxwell said, one's individual will thus remain uniquely his. God will not override it nor overwhelm it. Hence, we had better want the consequences of what we want. Boy, we should say that again. Brothers and sisters, we had better want the consequences of what we want. Because God will not take our agency away from us. President Henry B. Eyring of the First Presidency spoke of people today who choose to disregard prophetic counsel. Quoting, every time in my life when I have chosen to de 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 delay following inspired counsel or decided that I was an exception, I came to know that I had put myself in harm's way. Every time that I have listened to the counsel of prophets, felt, its felt it confirmed in prayer, and then followed it, I have found that I moved towards safety along the path. I have found that the way had been prepared for me and the rough places made smooth. God led me to safety along a path which was prepared with loving care, sometimes prepared long before. President Ezra Taft Benson taught the following regarding prophetic teachings. The prophet is not required to have any particular earthly training or credentials to speak on any subject or act on any matter at any time. Sometimes there are those who feel their earthly knowledge on a certain subject is superior to the heavenly knowledge which God gives to his prophets on the same subject. They feel the prophet must have the same earthly credentials or training which they have had before they will accept the prophet who has to say that might contradict earthly schooling. The prophet tells us what we need to know not always what we want to know. How we respond to the words of a living prophet when he tells us what we need to know but would rather not hear is a test of our faithfulness. The prophet can receive revelation on any matter, temporal or spiritual. Acts 27, 20 36, Prophetic Assurances. Paul assured the ship's crew and passengers that they would not perish in the storm. His words brought comfort to those who had lost all hope. Similarly, we can find hope and reassurance in the words of modern prophets and seers, despite the trials and hardships that are so prevalent in our times. President Thomas S. Monson taught, The moral footings of society continue to slip while those who attempt to safeguard those footings are often ridiculed and, at times, pic picketed and persecuted. Wars, natural disasters, and personal misfortunes continue to occur. It would be easy to become discouraged and cynical about the future or even fearful of what might come. The history of the church and this, the dispensation of the fullness of times, is replete with the experience of those who have struggled and yet who have remained steadfast and of good cheer as they have made the gospel of Jesus Christ the center of their lives. Again, the gospel of Jesus Christ the center of their lives. This attitude is what will pull us through whatever comes our way. It will not remove our troubles from us, but rather will enable us to face our challenges, to meet them head on, and to emerge victoriously. Probably one of the most misunderstood things in the church is that if I live the gospel, then my problems will go away. No, I will have problems, and many of them. The gospel is to help us through them. What does that great hymn say? That Christ came to wipe away our tears, not to take away our tears. 
continuing President Monson, I testify to you that our promised blessings are beyond measure. Though the storm clouds may gather, though the rains may pour down upon us, our knowledge of the gospel and our love of our Heavenly Father and of our Savior will comfort and sustain us and bring joy to our hearts as we walk uprightly and keep the commandments. There will be nothing in this world that can defeat us. My beloved brothers and sisters, fear not. Be of good cheer. The future is as bright as your faith. Acts 28, 1 through 5, a viper fastened onto Paul's hand. Those on board the ship found safety on the isle called Melita, or known as Malta. The term barbarous people means speakers of a strange language, not brutal ruffians. After their shipwreck, Paul and the other passengers made it safely to land. Later, while Paul was building a fire on the shore, he was bitten by a poisonous snake. However, he was unaffected by the venom. This incident was a fulfillment of the Savior's promise that his disciples would take up serpents and it should not hurt them. That was said in Mark chapter 16, verse 18. Acts 28, 17 through 31, Paul preached the gospel in Rome. Paul finally reached Rome and gained the desire of his heart to preach the gospel there. As far as we know, Paul was the first missionary to preach the gospel in Rome, as he had done in other cities. Paul preached first to the Jews, some of whom believed him and then turned his attention to all that came unto him, many of whom were like the Gentiles. While under house arrest, Paul wrote what some men termed his prison epistles. That would be Colossians, Ephesians, Philemon, and Philippians. After he spent two years under house arrest in Rome, it is believed that Paul was tried and released, and that he thereafter ministered in Asia, Greece, and perhaps Spain, before being imprisoned again in Rome. According to tradition, he was killed during the persecutions under Nero, sometimes between A.D. 64 and 68. Paul alluded to, the fu to his future death in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. Well, thank you, brothers and sisters, for watching. May we have the courage to stand up and make Christ the center of our life and to submit our wills to him. Thank you.